Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Aaron Newcomb joins me. We're going to be talking about interactive devices programmed in JavaScript. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Aaron Newcomb. Episode 365, recorded December 1st, 2015. Kenoma. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Braintree. Even the best mobile app won't work without the right payments API. That's where the Braintree V.0 SDK comes in. One amazingly simple integration gives you every way to pay. Try out the sandbox and see for yourself at braintreepayments.com slash floss. And by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may want to look at right after the show. Do not do it while you're driving if you're driving, but go ahead and try this out afterwards. Uh, I'm coming to you from lovely, once again, beautiful downtown Santa Monica. And uh, joining me today again, uh, frequently he uh, joins me as co-host. Joining me today as well, Aaron Duca. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Randall. How's it going? I think it's well, you know, I, I, I got one hour less of sleep last night than I wanted to. It happens frequently, but it's apparently uh, I was I was hanging out with some of my friends and I was about to leave. And then they walked me around in the corner. And there's some more of my friends I wanted to hang out with. And I went, oh, God. And so I stayed up with them for another hour and a half. And I was like, OK, that was a mistake. But uh, I think the <laughs> caffeine's kicking in any second here and it should be just fine. And I presume you're speaking to us from your usual uh, cluster of things around you room. Yes, yes, from my lair, from my lair, where I do my my daily work, but also all my a lot of my maker activities when I'm not down at the makerspace. And uh, just for John, I did take the phone off the hook today. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no more no more loud rings. Hopefully during the during the show. For some reason, right. uh, if you haven't noticed in the past, my phone only rings this early in the morning when I'm doing a show. So, <laughs> so I, I I preempted all that. I took the phone right off the hook. Awesome. And it's really appropriate that you're surrounded by all your maker style things because today's show is, in fact, very maker related. We have Peter Hadi on today. He's with, representing the Konoma company, Konoma organization. And he's going to be talking to us about all sorts of tiny devices that can be programmed with, and here's the kicker, JavaScript. What do you know about this so far? I'm sure you've researched a little bit. Uh, well, I have. I actually got to see one when I was down visiting uh, Maker Media headquarters down in uh, San Francisco. Um, I got to see a few things, and this was one of the things that I got to see. And it's a really interesting platform, uh, especially since it's built around JavaScript, which isn't necessarily the the I would say the the go to choice always for for makers. But there's always a need for people come from different backgrounds, and there's always a need to have uh, tools that work with what you're comfortable using. And so it's a really cool platform, both hardware and software. And so I'm excited to talk to our guest and learn more about it. Well, let's contrast this just for a second with what other platforms use. I mean, we had, uh, I, I remember processing was a language for a while. Is that still being used? Yeah, processing is still being used. A lot of people that are using Raspberry Pi now um, have a whole variety of, of choices, right? So a lot of people use Python for Raspberry Pi, uh, but you can use Perl, of course, for Raspberry Pi or Java. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They all work, of oh. course. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and so people use what usually whatever they're whatever they're comfortable with, and um, I would say JavaScript. There's been a void around JavaScript um, uh, until now. Of course, you can run JavaScript as well uh, on on Raspberry Pi, but um, uh, certainly not on Arduino, for example, uh, which uses a C plus plus variant. So, you know that that's another big one. But uh, yeah, JavaScript has has kind of been missing. So it's interesting. It's an interesting choice for a uh, for a platform like this. Yeah, we'll find out a lot more about that. But first, I have a word from our sponsor, because this episode is brought to you by Braintree. Developers around the world have embraced Braintree V.0 SDK as the easiest way to add secure mobile payments to their apps and websites. No matter what payment type, Braintree accepts it. 
Apple Pay, Android Pay, PayPal, Venmo, credit cards, even Bitcoin. And if something new pops up, Braintree will support that too. It's the same payment solution used by Uber, Airbnb, and GitHub, so you know it scales. There are simple, secure payments, code you can integrate in minutes, and developers, we got you. Don't worry about taking days to integrate your payments with Braintree. It's done in minutes. The Braintree code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients. And there's SDKs in seven languages, .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, yay Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby. LN code with clear documentation and 10 lines of in-app code. So Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types in one integration. Integrating it into your app is as easy as inserting a few lines of code. Try out the sandbox and see for yourself at braintreepayments.com slash floss. And we thank Braintree for supporting Floss Weekly. And let's go ahead and bring on our guest, Peter uh, Hottie. Welcome to the co welcome to the code. <laughs> welcome to the show. Hey, Randall. Morning. Hi, and where are you speaking to us from? I am in Santa Clara, California. Oh, okay. So I'll wave in your general direction there. It's gonna yeah, just wave north. <laughs> Very good. So we gave our sort of uh, intro and sort of what we think this is all about. But why don't you go ahead and give us the 30,000-foot view? What, what, is, what is this all about and what problem is it trying to solve? Sure. So um, we kind of have two sides to the house. There's the hardware side and the software side. And the, the really great things kind of happen when you put them together. Um, the hardware side is a product called Konoma Create um, that Aaron mentioned briefly before. I'm just going to hold one up so people who haven't seen it kind of know what they look like. It is a green and white box. You see it has a screen built in. Um, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, runs Linux inside. And we, uh, we built it as a device for makers, really specifically for makers. But... Um, for people who want to get into making, um, in large part, uh, who are, it turns out, intimidated by having a bare green board with lots of, of pins sticking out and wires and, and just all the things that they have to do to get started that are so unfamiliar. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people who want to try making um, but don't want to start at that level. And so, you know, we put a nice case around this. We put a touch screen on it. And that allows the device to have its own personality, its own character that people can interact with directly instead of having to type to a command line. And then, as you guys mentioned in the intro, the other really important thing is the software. And everything on this device is built around JavaScript. So even though it's Linux inside and you can tell that in and do all the things you would normally do there, um, the device really is fundamentally programmed in JavaScript. And so... Makers, people who are getting started, can live completely in the JavaScript world and never have to dive down in, into the Linux layer to create their first projects. And we, again, we find that to be a really big deal because this power, you know, Linux is powerful, um, but that, that's also something that has a fairly steep learning curve for somebody who just wants to blink a light. And, and so we're really both on the hardware and the software side trying to provide a nice pathway in, but it's, it has all the depth. It's there. It's not a toy. It's not just a place where, you know, you're going to learn and then move on. You can build real, rich, complete products. And um, to put that into context, uh, Kenoma, the, the organization I'm with, is part of Marvell Semiconductor, which is a 5,000 or so person company um, that makes chips for some of the biggest brands in the world. And the, and the chip inside this product has been used by dozens of companies in real commercial products. Um, so there's a full path from kind of getting started and making all the way through to, to mass, mass production. Okay, so what, I'm using this Kenoma Create, I've got an interface, I'm programming in steps for something, but what's the something this thing's going to be talking to? Yeah, so, you know, we, um, we believe very deeply in, in openness, and so the, the something is, is more or less any sensor that you can buy off of, you know, the usual sites like an Adafruit uh, or a SparkFun, um, and, and so we just have open open ports, open pins for serial, for uh, I2C, squared for digital, for analog. Um, so you can plug in more or less anything. So the same kinds of projects that you would make with something like an Arduino, like a Raspberry Pi, you can make with Kenoma Create. Um, the cool thing is, of course, it, it distinguishes itself in a couple ways too. It has a built-in touchscreen and it has a built-in battery. And so, uh, and Wi-Fi, in fact. And so we had uh, one of our, our customers take this thing and strap it to a hang glider. Um, mm. And he ran sensors out to the wingtips um, so he could, could sense the temperature out there. And then he has a touchscreen mounted in front of him on the screen, uh, on, on the hang glider. So he can control the interface and he can see what the temperature is out at the edges of the wings um, because it's based on the, the rising and falling temperature. The hang glider stays aloft longer. And, and so he was able with Kenoma Create to really focus on building a great software experience that he could literally use, you know, while 
gravity is pulling him down to earth at a ridiculous rate um, and, and focus on getting that right and not all of the details of making the hardware work and getting the kernel installed and built and all that stuff. And so it, it, it's a really great project and an environment for people who want to build mobile projects um, and, and who are just exploring new ideas. Wow, you know, I'm just thinking, I'm reminded, uh, Stephen Roberts is uh, one of my longtime friends, and uh, he built the uh, the bike nomad that had all this satellite gear and uh, com portable computing and had, you know, touch keyboard and things like that. And he went on to build a boat and said he was tired of sucking up fumes from cars. <laughs> he wanted to get out on the water. And so he started to build all that, too. And I remember that uh, he was working with another friend of mine, uh, Ned Kahn's, who was going to program the interface all in Smalltalk because that seemed like a nice interface uh, programming language. But it sounds like this would be right up his alley because he could wire all sorts of sensors into it. He'd have this nice touch screen and he could drive it off batteries. He had solar panels on there and also had, had a pedal so he could actually pedal to charge up his batteries. So it sounds like the kind of thing that he would like, right? Yeah, no, exactly. It's, uh, and it's funny you mentioned Smalltalk. Um, you know, the, uh, the history of JavaScript is, in fact, that a lot of the ideas came from the Smalltalk language. Um, and so it is a great language for building user interfaces. In. And the, the, the whole idea of just very quick prototyping, being able to, to add a user interface object to modify its behavior without having to define new classes, um, and to do that very rapidly is something that we, we found is so critical for user interface. You know, people, people think when they're building a new product idea, oh, I've got the idea, I build it, and I'm done. And, of course, it turns out that's never the case. Your, your idea was okay, but not perfect. Your choice of sensors and components was terrible. And, you know, your screen layout for user interface was all wrong. And you're, you're constantly changing those things. And so what you want is, what we found is you want hardware and software that you can just change really quickly um, so that if you have a good idea in the, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, you can get it working. Um, the other thing we found that's really cool, actually, is um, having the screen lets you simulate all kinds of buttons and knobs and controls, right? And so we had a bunch of interns this summer who started out building a project that was entirely driven with the touch screen, with all on-screen buttons. And once they kind of had the interaction right and figured out the kind of knobs and buttons they wanted, they went down to a uh, tech shop and, and built a physical set of controls and then wired those in to use instead. Right, and so the, the different components there are, are useful at different phases of your development. It's not just idea, build, done. There's 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 so many steps and and reiterations of what you're doing in there uh, to get to something that works well. And by playing with it in uh, JavaScript, you don't have to uh, keep buying different hardware and trying that. You can actually keep prototyping. That sounds like a really great interface for that. Uh, what's uh, I think one of the components of what the, this uh, what you've done recently is, is bring out uh, ECMAScript six. Can you describe what that brings to the picture? Yeah, it's um, it's a really fascinating thing. You know, JavaScript as a language has been around you know since the dawn of the internet, and um, it clearly uh, is is incredibly well established and. Just to go back, fifth edition was kind of uh, the standardization of all the different interesting ideas people had in browsers. Um, and, you know, things like jQuery had evolved to provide a consistent interface in JavaScript um, because the browsers weren't consistent. Fifth edition, which is a few years ago now, um, really made all that standard. And so um, JavaScript has become a platform, not just kind of a language with lots of variations. And the, the committee, the people who did that were incredibly self-controlled in fifth edition in that they didn't, they had all these ideas, you know, they're language people. And so they, they know all the things a language could be. And they didn't put any of that in fifth edition. And they, they seem to have kept a very good list. And over the last few years, that has become uh, what is now JavaScript 6th edition, which was just uh, formally ratified back in June. And so it's, it's the first massive revision to the language, really, since it was created. Um, and so it brings all sorts of new features. Um, the list goes on and on. The full spec is like 1,500 pages, so I, I won't even try to explain it. But they, you know, they looked at things like what are people doing with modules? You know, JavaScript never had its own library interface. And so things like Node um, invented their own module interface. And they were clever in the way they did it, but it's still not as good as what you could do if support was built into the language. So 6th edition brings very rich module support. Um, people have been working with promises as a way to manage asynchronous code um, in JavaScript. It's 
been a real challenge. And promises are now built into the language as part of what's there. Uh, generators is another feature which is, is kind of like a coroutine. JavaScript is, is single threaded by design. And uh, generators give you a way to kind of have multiple, uh, not quite independent threads of execution, but coroutines that can run side by side um, inside the language. Um, there's templates which make it much easier um, to just put strings together. Um, and the list, the list goes on and on and on. They finally have real scoped variables, so everything isn't a global variable, which um, is, is a godsend for those of us who, who work in JavaScript and C at the same time and can't keep that straight. Um, and the list goes on and on. I actually wrote a blog post called Language Matters um, when we announced our JavaScript 6th edition support that went through a whole lot of why we think it's important. Um, and then they also made changes in terms of deprecating just a few features of the language that made it more, uh, more expensive to run um, and made it slower um, to be able to implement closures efficiently, for example. And so um, by, by making a few small changes that aren't backwards compatible, they, um, they were able to get performance. Um, and they, they were careful because, you know, JavaScript runs the web, so you have to turn on JavaScript 6th edition on the web um, so that backwards compatibility is still there. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, we um, we got way out in front on JavaScript 6 edition support. We knew it was inevitable, um, and we thought the features were superb for our users. And so back in December, we moved all of our development resources to working on 6 edition support. And um, as of this summer, we are at, there's a, there's a standard set of tasks um, by a, a, a guy named, goes by Kangax, um, that all the different browsers and engines run against. And uh, the Kenoma engine, which is called XS6, has implemented 97% of the new uh, JavaScript 6th edition features. For the, for the real geeks out there who will, will go and check that, it's like 96.8 something, but, you know, round. Um, and, you know, the closest engine behind that is uh, Microsoft Edge at 80 one percent, I believe, and then the rest are quickly, you know, dropping down into the 60s and 40s. So, you know, as a as a as a small team who's who's really focused on makers, we're giving makers access to the very latest technologies inside of uh, Kenoma Create, and we've actually shipped that support this fall. So, people who are making with Kenoma Create can use the latest language features of JavaScript 6th edition. So, uh, which I'm kind of curious at this point, I mean, I mentioned it up front that JavaScript probably wouldn't, might not be the first thing that a maker would think of to use for a project, unless they were familiar with it already. So, what, was there ever a time when you considered using something else uh, besides, you know, did the JavaScript come first or did the platform come first and then, oh, JavaScript would be perfect for this? Yeah, no, it's a good question, and it's. I, I wish I had a really careful, thoughtful answer about that. We, um, uh, I'll give you the, the, the complete truth, uh, we started Kenoma, the effort about, uh, it's, it's almost 15 years ago now, and we were very focused on portable software, and we knew at the, the C level kind of how we wanted to do that, and we knew we needed a scripting language. And uh, I'm fortunate to have somebody on my team who's done a huge amount of work with language, and so we started debating, like, should we design a language, what would it look like? And we were, we were crossing the street in San Francisco one night after a few too many drinks. And we just said, oh, everybody like uses JavaScript. And this was, this was 15 years ago. And we said, so why don't we just do that? And I, you know, I asked my friend, can you implement that? And he's like, oh, yeah, no problem. And, and he did. And, and so we've been using it ever since. And we, um, you know, it was a good, it was an easy call. Of course, everybody then knew JavaScript, or at least a ton of people did. You know, we couldn't have predicted the momentum that it would continue to pick up, the unbelievable standards work that's been done. Um, on 5th edition and now 6th edition and, you know, how it's been adopted into things like Node for the server. Um, but, um, you know, so we, we kind of got lucky and we think in terms of a good choice. Um, I think, you know, languages are fascinating and I have some people on my team who try every new language that pops up and, and I learn a lot from them. But, you know, as a programmer, I, I always want to have a language that I'm very fast in. And I can work quickly and comfortably. And, and, and what I've found over the years, and I've really been working in JavaScript for forever now, is that it, it, it just gets the job done. And, and there's just, you know, it's so well documented, so well standardized, and there's so much code out there, you know, on the web um, that, that I can use it um, and, and just be fast. And then, 
It's also a nice transition between C because the syntax is, is quite similar and the structures are, are similar. And so the mode shift mentally between C and JavaScript is relatively painless um, compared to what it would be with some other languages. And the other thing I notice is that, I mean, I think JavaScript is one thing that certainly sets this apart. Um, but the other thing that sets it apart is the platform itself, the hardware, uh, which you don't see. I think you mentioned this earlier on. Usually you get a board. If you think Arduino or Raspberry Pi, uh, you get a board that, you know, looks something like this. You get a green board and there's, you know, a bunch of pins on it. And, and uh, for beginners, it's very difficult. In fact, we're, we're, set, we're doing some classes <clears throat> on, on Raspberry Pi and Arduino at the Makerspace just to get people past that, you know, fear of, ah, I think I'm going to break this. How do I set it up? Can I touch it? Mm -hmm. um, all of those things are, are, I think, are barriers to entry for, for um, makers who might haven't been, might haven't tried these types of platforms for a while. So I think that the, the hardware itself and the, the um, uh, I mean, it, to me, it almost looks like, and maybe John can pull up some some pictures off, through, off your website because there's some beautiful yep. pictures on there. Um, to me, it almost feels a little bit like one laptop per child. Um, I don't know if that, if, if that crossed your mind when you were putting together the color scheme and the, um, the, the interface or how it looks. I mean, it looks like it's, and it's not, I don't want to say it's necessarily for kids, but it does look like it would be very good in an educational setting as well. Um, so did those things cross your mind when you were d designing the actual hardware piece of this as well? You know, we, uh, it's a good question. We very much had beginners in, in mind and, and even kids um, as a p possible um, audience. Um, Marvell, uh, the, you know, our parent company, actually was one of the major funders of uh, OLPC and uh, provided the, the main silicon for that. Um, so those ideas were very much in the air, um, although consciously it wasn't part of, uh, wasn't, wasn't a design point. We were very much coming from kind of the board and how can we make this accessible for makers, but we wanted it to be comfortable, right? And so that green and white color scheme, um, was deliberate. We knew that wasn't going to look just like, uh, you know, a Raspberry Pi, um, sitting on a table and that gets people's attention and it's comfortable. You know, we've done, uh, workshops with. Uh, just beginners, people who have really never worked with hardware before. And, you know, they laugh as they start to play with it. Um, the fact that there's a built-in touchscreen means that they don't have to interact with the computer to even do basic things. We can teach them how to plug in components, how to blink a light, how to read a sensor, um, just using the apps that are built in. You know, we have one called Pin Explorer, where it lets you, if you have an analog control attached, graph the output of the, gra the, the control. Um, without having to have a PC or a web browser or anything. And that direct interaction where people can just focus on the device and not have to worry about a command line in the PC really changes kind of their confidence level and their willingness to go in. We're hosting a, an after-school program with a group of um, elementary school students um, uh, here at Marvell uh, this fall. And they have no problem with Kenoma Create. They just pick it up. They're like, okay, I know what this is. It's a touch screen. They're like, that works like a tablet. That works like a phone. I know how to use that. And so they're ready to go. And, you know, they learn the, they learn the fundamental ideas from there. Uh, and then they can move on to um, writing scripts and, you know, working in an IDE and all the things that, that, that you do as a maker. Uh, but um, they really can just get started in a, in a painless way. And we, we have found that to be a big deal. Um, and we, we get huge interest from, from educators every time we show up at Maker Faire because they know that if you put a Raspberry Pi into a classroom with a bare board like that, um, you're going to need to get more soon because um, kids will do what kids do. Yeah, and, and also I think even uh, Eben Upton has said that um, that platform, even the Raspberry Pi, his platform, the Raspberry Pi platform, isn't necessarily suitable for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was asked once if you know you should give it out to everybody in a, in a school, and he said, "No, I don't think you should give it out to every every kid. Um, some some kids aren't going to take to it." So I think this is a much more friendly, especially for younger kids. Um, but what about the programming side? How friendly or how easy is it for kids to actually uh, pick up the uh, kids or? Beginners, let's say. They didn't necessarily mean kids, but right. beginners. How easy is it for beginners to pick up uh, the code and start using it? I know you have a concept of uh, blocks, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Konoma JS blocks. I don't know if that makes it easier. Mm -hmm. 
Talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, you know, beginner is always an interesting thing. You know, we have um, people who, uh, you know, at OSCON this year, I met a, a bunch of people who are really hardware makers um, who had finally realized they needed to learn software to be able to do things um, more effectively. And they were interested as, and this is a platform for getting started with JavaScript. You know, they knew C, but they wanted to, they wanted to work their way up the food chain and, and work, uh, work in scripts. Um, we, we have kids... Um, who get started? You know, I did a, a project with my son for his science fair this past year, where where he did a little bit of light JavaScript work. Um, clearly, I was I was hovering over him and helping him, but but he actually understood what he was doing and, and made it work. Um, and he was, that was a fourth grade science fair project, so it's possible. But you know, you mentioned blocks, and that that was something that uh, actually one of our customers came to us with, and they said, could we use Blockly um, to program a Kinoma Create style device, and we said, why not? So we went and uh, we took Blockly, which is Google's visual programming environment, and we adapted it so it works directly with Kinoma Create. Uh, so from a web page, you can arrange some blocks and it will download JavaScript to create without any IDE or anything else involved, just blast it over Wi-Fi. And um, again, we've tried this with, with kids and they, they take to it immediately. They have no problem, you know, manipulating the blocks in, in a browser and, you know, they understand you press run and... and the create does something, it blinks a light or it puts a button on the screen. And, um, you know, what you find, of course, with, with small kids is they, they get a project working and then they, they spend a lot of time customizing it, right? I want to change the background color. I want to change the screen. I want to record different sounds. And little by little, they, they work their way into more interesting projects. One of the things that I really like about Blockly and one of the reasons that we've invested in it with Kenoma JS Blocks is that it's a visual programming language that doesn't stop at being a visual programming language. Um, it has a path forward to working in JavaScript. And this was done deliberately by Google, who created it as a path for learning languages. So just like in your browser, you have view source and Blockly, you have a button that says view JavaScript. So you drag your blocks out and you can say view script and it'll show you exactly the script that it generates. Um, so you can move the blocks around and see that. And so I actually think not only is it a good tool for kids, but um, for people learning JavaScript or even just learning the APIs of Kenoma JS, it's a great tool, you know, uh, you know, let yourself... Um, even if you've been programming for years and years, let yourself have the freedom to try a visual programming language environment for a few minutes. And you can use Kenoma JS just in our web page right now and create some blocks and view the source and see the kind of code that we generate. And we, you know, we made an effort just like Google did in Blockly so that the generated code is pretty clean, right? So it's not, you know, thousands of lines of libraries and all this stuff. It's the blocks map more or less one-to-one -one, um, to objects in Kenoma JS. And that allows you um, to really learn and build something. So, you know, we're, we're working on all kinds of different levels. Um, you know, another place where we did it, um, another kind of beginner is college students. And we, uh, one of my guys taught a course at UC Berkeley um, in the spring. And that course was all based on Kenoma JS. And the students there built um, device prototypes using Kenoma JS and built simulators of those devices in some cases. And one of the great things about using Kenoma JS in JavaScript was the students quickly got comfortable with that and could focus on making great projects. You know, I, I had seen that course in past years and a lot of the students, when it came to final projects, didn't have something that worked. And so they showed their poster and they explained their vision and, and the idea was great and, you know, they explained why it didn't quite work, but everybody, when they worked with, with our tools, had something that worked and worked well and could really talk about the ideas in the project and, and show how it worked. And so, you know, they were able to get going, get going quickly and get over the hurdles of learning the technology so that they could focus on building a great project for their class. Wow. Wow, that's really cool. And I think this mm -hmm. is important um, to, to have a platform like this that uh, makes those things easy uh, because it, it is off-putting, especially for people that haven't done it before, uh, to try to pick something up like this and say, okay, I want to make this light blink, but I have no idea how to code. I have no idea where to plug things in uh, or what to do. And so I think, I think this is really great for, for people like that. You also have a, your own IDE, which is uh, something that I've certainly found helpful for people beginning Arduino. Uh, who have a kind of a light version of an IDE, uh, at least it's a programming interface, we can call it that. Um, but talk about the IDE. What's, what's different about your IDE? Why should people use it? 
Yeah, so we have, um, I, I agree with you, I think you need an ID for people getting started. And, and frankly, I mean, I've been programming for a few years now, and I, I still really like having an ID there to just kind of keep things simple and organized for me. Um, I, I will, I have to say up front, especially um, on, on this podcast, we have a set of command line tools. And so people who don't like an IDE can use those. Um, they're, they're all there. They're all open. They're all documented. Enjoy. The, um, the IDE is, for better or worse, uh, based on Eclipse. And I, I say better or worse because it's, uh, it's an incredibly professional environment, right? It can do anything and everything. Um, and so it's, it's very powerful. It is, uh, can be a little overwhelming for somebody just getting started. We often advise people just look at the middle part of the screen and ignore kind of all the controls around the edges and you'll be fine. Um, we've got some great tutorials up for people to use that. Um, and we've done a lot of work on Eclipse um, to make it easy for people to use. So I, I don't want to scare you off, but it is a little bit um, strong for, you know, somebody who's never done anything before. Um, and that's why I think like the Blockly interface with Kenoma JS Blocks is a really great place um, for people to get started. Um, and I said the other thing that's very cool is that the, the app itself is in some ways, the, the device itself is in some ways the IDE. You know, a lot of the built-in apps um, are doing the things that a typical command line tool or an IDE would do um, in terms of files, in terms of network connection, in terms of configuring pins um, and setting up the device. And so we really tried to make it so that people could do a lot of what they wanted directly with the device instead of having to rely on a separate IDE or, or a separate um, a separate command line. And I think one of the things that's interesting that we're, we're playing with is how much of that can we move to mobile? Right? Because at this point, um, everybody has, a, has access to either a phone or a tablet. Um, and in fact, a lot of people, kids, um, may have a phone or a tablet and not have a computer. Right? And so we'd like people to be able to do as much as possible um, from those environments. And that's something we're looking at. Um, you know, Kenoma JS, our environment runs on mobile just like it runs on the desktop and just like it runs on Kenoma Create. And so people can build there. Um, and so we, we think that that's an interesting part of the environment and, and the t tools shouldn't all have to live uh, on the computer. Yeah, and it looks like, I mean, to take that uh, in another direction as well, I mean, it looks like you're thinking about that in terms of the other platforms you're working on because there's uh, smaller versions, right, without the screen. I think there's uh, Kenoma HD and Kenoma Element, and I'm assuming those are for people who don't want or don't need the the touchscreen display and, and all of the all of the uh, pins and everything. They can just pick up a small device and, and run with it. You know exactly, and Kenoma Element is a is a fascinating product. We're um, we're uh, just beginning mass production on that now, and it, it's a single. The, the chip is 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 worth talking about for a minute. It's a single chip that has built into it a half a megabyte of RAM, um, the CPU obviously, uh, and Wi-Fi. And um, so the only thing you really have to add to it to get to a working uh, device is you know some electricity and a crystal. And so, and the chip is literally uh, like a centimeter on a side. Um, oh yeah, here, there, I can show you. It's that board, and the, the little chip at the diagonal there is uh, is the chip I'm talking about. Um, and so, you know, like Kenoma Create, we put it in a in a nice case, so people don't have to have a bare board lying around. Um, but but that chip is a computer, um, and and we're able to run JavaScript in a half a megabyte of RAM on that. And so we really see that as being uh, an IoT device. And, and again, Marvell has commercial customers that are in deployment with real products in the market um, that are based on that. So it's, it's not just an interesting experiment. Um, it's really a place where uh, people can build real IoT devices using JavaScript and using C. Um, on the other end, you mentioned Kenoma HD, and that, that, is, that goes completely in the other direction. I actually don't have one in front of me at the moment. Um, but it's a dongle, sort of like a, a Chromecast. Um, and it plugs into the back of your TV and it has an HDMI out. And it doesn't have any pins because the idea is it lives behind your TV and it's your bridge where you can JavaScript your TV, right? And you can control what's on there, pull in podcasts, um, pull in photos, um, but have a completely open environment um, to drive your TV and build apps there. Um, and at um, a couple conferences earlier this year, we showed um, the whole collection of devices, Kenoma Create, Kenoma Element, and Kenoma HD, working together where the Kenoma HD was providing a dashboard on your home on your TV, 
Um, so you could see that and interact with it that way. Um, so there's a lot of neat things you can do here um, where people can weave together, knit together the kinds of scenarios um, that they're interested in bringing to life. And because they all run the same, uh, the same basic JavaScript software, once they've learned those skills, they can apply them to all kinds of different devices and all kinds of different scenarios. And we, we think that's really important too. Well, that's a great segue to my next question, which is how portable is the code? You call this a prototyping platform. Um, so is the goal for people to use this to develop something and then take up the code and put it somewhere else? Or is, are you thinking people are going to use uh, an element, for example, to once they get everything developed and working, they would take the, maybe the element and embed that into a product somewhere or put it out in the wild? Um, it, so, so I guess maybe that's two questions, but I'm just kind of curious about code portability especially. Yeah, the um, the code is is entirely designed to be uh, portable. We run it on iOS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, a bunch of different flavors of Linux, free RTOS, and ThreadX on a regular basis. Um, so you know it'll run where you want to put it um, without a, without a big deal. And, and all of the the native code that, that powers the engine is just ANSI C. It's not even C plus plus. So it really ports incredibly well. Um, and the idea is, yeah, you start prototyping in JavaScript and then you ship in JavaScript. You know, the entire user interface of Kinoma Create, everything that you see in terms of the built-in apps is written in JavaScript. You know, we're really eating our own dog food. We're building things the way that we want um, developers to build things. And so there's no such thing as a first-party app versus a third-party app. Everybody has access to the same things and is building on the same tools. Um, and, you know, we achieve in our JavaScript-powered app 60 frames per second animations on a device that's only running at um, 800 megahertz with no GPU. Um, it's a big deal. It's really hard to achieve that level of performance um, in a typical scripted environment. So we see this going all the way through to production in terms of the hardware. Um, you, um, in terms of the software, sorry, in the, the hardware, the, the same as possible, you could certainly take, you could imagine taking the element board here um, and embedding it in your product. Um, it's not that big. Um, we also, however, for people who want to... Um, to make their own boards, and it's, all, it's only a two-layer board, so it's actually very possible with Element to make your own boards. Uh, we publish, for all the hardware that we ship, we publish all the design files for the board, for the PCB, and for the cases, um, so that people can um, do whatever they want. We've had people with Kenoma Create take the boards apart and build their own cases, for example, um, so that they can, they can get a different form factor, a different material, a different look. Um, easy enough to do that with Element, but really not that bad um, to send out and have another board design. And we've got some partners that we work with um, who will be referring people to who can take their designs and do that as well. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, we really, uh, we, we, we're interested in making this as easy as possible for the beginner, but we're trying to build a full path through the software where you could, you could start with something like Kenoma JS Blocks and end up with mass production. And, and some of that code that you generated with Blocks might be part of that mass production um, effort. And so you don't reach this point where you take your prototype and you throw everything away and start again. Um, that's where projects fall a year behind because they don't realize how much of the knowledge is baked into that prototype. And so we, we want people to just kind of be able to keep iterating, keep carrying forward the parts that work and, and rewrite the parts that don't as they get smarter. Well, you know, this is, oh man, I, I've been sitting here in, in you know, the chat room and, and, and whispering in Aaron's ear there, but I, I want one of these. This, this is, I'm not normally a maker. I'm not really turned on by this stuff, but this, I want one of these now to play with. So uh, you may have yourself a new customer really, really soon. Um, just so thanks. And I know Aaron wants to ask some more questions, but I have some important business to deal with, which is helping to pay for the show. Whether you're an experienced code warrior or just getting started, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets which are virtual private servers that can be customized and developed quickly to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. I myself am a DigitalOcean customer, been so since February when I first found out that they were running FreeBSD in the cloud. I went, yay. DigitalOcean is built for developers and used by over 400,000 of them, including me, as I just said. Deploy and configure your droplets via streamlined control panel or simple API. You can choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, Core, 
ROS and FreeBSD, yay. Uh, servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigs of RAM, and 640 gigs of SSD hard drive space. And I tell you, those drives are really fast. Auto backups and snapshots let you easily clone, deploy, and resize droplets as you grow. Uh, you can deploy servers in all regions around the world with gigabit speeds and 99.99% uptime. And it's easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. DigitalOcean is incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 a month. But we're going to make it so you get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code FLOSS for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Floss Weekly. Now, I've got one question before I turn it back to Aaron because I'm curious about this. So you say you're programming in a JavaScript environment. Are you using some sort of framework like Angular? So, good question. We, uh, we are using some sort of framework. Uh, it's our own framework called Konoma.js. And the reason that we have our own framework, um, every, every year we have interns, every summer. And the interns always ask me, why, why are you using your own framework? Because, you know, they showed up and they knew Angular, they knew something. And uh, I always have the same talk with them. And I say, you know, our focus isn't the web, right? There's, there's dozens of companies building great frameworks for the web, maybe hundreds at this point. Um, we're really focused on embedded. You know, this device, I said, is 800 megahertz, which is, you know, pathetic by um, horsepower standards of current mobile and desktop. But it's everything you need for IoT. Um, this device, uh, Kenoma Element, is 200 megahertz and only has a half a megabyte of RAM. It's not 500, that's not half a gigabyte, half a megabyte, right? 512K. And you can't run those frameworks on a device of that class. You really need a framework which is designed for lightweight devices. And so, you know, different frameworks are built and optimized for different purposes. And, and a lot of what's on the web has been optimized for the convenience of the web developer, which is, of course, a really great idea for a web framework. Ours is optimized for performance, for memory footprint, and the convenience of an embedded developer who is trying to build a great user experience on devices of this, this caliber. Um, the good thing is Konoma.js borrows a lot of ideas from the web. So cascading styles, for example, is something we have. Um, we now use promises uh, for asynchronous callbacks. And so it will be familiar in many ways to people who are coming from the web and some of these other frameworks and, and different in other ways. Um, and, you know, we've had lots of people who can learn it. So I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a, a big challenge for people to do that, but it will be a little bit different if you're familiar with another JavaScript framework. But, uh, you know, take it in and learn it and, and understand why it is the way it is. And, and you can do some really powerful things that way. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, uh, you've got these on your website. We should mention the, the prices you can reserve these products, right? Uh, the Konoma creates uh, about $150, the Elements 20, and the uh, HD is 25. <laughs> um, it, this seems to be something that would be perfect for like a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign. Did you, did you try that route or um, have you thought about, about doing that? Because uh, it seems like this would be you know, right up that alley. Yeah, no, so uh, Kenoma Create, actually, we did, uh, we did a crowdfunding campaign around it about uh, maybe 18, 20 months ago. Uh, we did that on um, Indiegogo, um, who uh, were, were absolutely fantastic um, in terms of supporting us. Um, and, you know, we did that with, with uh, Kenoma Create. It was our first hardware product. And as, as you guys have, have observed, it's really different from other prototyping platforms, right, in so many ways. Um, both the hardware and the software are really unique, and we weren't sure if anybody cared. Uh, you know, we thought it was great, but and our friends were nice and told us it was great, uh, but we didn't know for certain. And, and you know, frankly, Marvell, um, as a semiconductor company, thought it was cool, but they weren't sure either. And so a crowdfunding campaign was a really great way for us to go and see, will, will anybody spend their own money on this? Will anybody sign up and, and, and support us and give it a try? And we did a crowdfunding campaign. We, we hit all our goals. We exceeded them. And... Um, we, uh, we got it out there. You know, the thing I'm most proud of is um, we shipped the hardware and we delivered it to all the funders. Um, one of the things that happens with hardware crowdfunding campaigns is that they're, you know, six months late, a year late, and then they, they just kind of evaporate. And, um, you know, we, we, we delivered. Uh, we were a couple months late. Um, 
Uh, but but in fact, uh, delivered something that worked and worked well, um, and people are, are using it today. As you see, it's available, and it, it's available through Spark Fund. So uh, it's a really great retailer, not only um, for Kinoma Create, but for all the components that you want to plug into Create for accelerometers and LEDs and wires and you know all the all the good stuff you need. Um, so great a great place to get that. Um, for Kinoma Element and Kinoma HD, we sort of felt like we knew what we were doing um, in terms of the customers, and so we chose not to crowdfund those, um, although we certainly talked about it. Um, there is sort of an itch in the team to do more crowdfunding, but I, my, my sense is we'll probably do it more around um, something that's a, a little bit more of a consumer product with a developer angle than a, a developer-focused product at, the, at this point, but you know, time will tell. Um, but, but the crowdfunding campaign was great, and you know, it, it certainly emphasized a few things. We had a number of people who said, it's great. You say it has Linux. You know, where is your open source repository? Um, you know, how do I get to that? So I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fund you until you, until you do that. Um, and so that, that some of those messages really kicked us into gear in terms of getting our open source uh, work together, and our GitHub repository is there, and everything is there, and people are using it um, as it should be. Um, so crowdfunding is a really spectacular way to validate ideas, to get some money, um, if that's what you need for your project, um, and also just get your priorities straight because your customers will tell you um, really what's important to them um, and they vote with their credit cards, which is, is a really powerful thing. Uh, that's fantastic to hear about. I mean, this is an open source uh, show after all. Um, and I was just going to get to that. So, that, I mean, that's just fantastic to hear that people were demanding that the code be open source um, because that's that's really what it's all about. Um, it, it, talk about that for a little bit. I mean, how open is the product? Um, is it all open? Is the Are the hardware specs, for example, open if I wanted to design? I mean, you kind of referenced there's some partners that can help uh, lay out different types <coughs> of boards and things. But talk about the openness of the of the platform. Sure. So the hardware specs are completely open. Um, so the, the board designs, the case designs, everything, the, the bomb is all uh, up on our GitHub repository. And, and you, can, you can grab that today for Kenoma Create. And as Kenoma Element, um, the design gets finalized and it better because we're starting mass production. Um, the, those will go up as well. Um, so that, that's everything you need there. In terms of the software, all the core software is open source. Um, Marvell as a company believes in making money and I, I they pay me so I support them. Um, so the upper layers of Kenoma Create, the, the very top, the kind of user interface for our own apps is not open source today, although it's something where, where we continually revisit um, that part we hold. But everything you need to do to take an app that you built on Kenoma Create using our tools and using what's there um, can run on top of the open source infrastructure that we provide. So there's nothing stopping you from taking something all the way to production. And we have people using that open source in, in a number of ways, some of which I can talk about. We actually have a, a developer in France um, named Haruni um, that's using our open source code to build Android and iOS apps. And those are in the, the App Store and the Google Play Store today. Um, we have another developer in San Francisco named uh, Dozen that's making some really gorgeous um, user interface um, experiments and, and projects for their customers. And some of those are up on the App Store. Uh, Dynamic Sushi is a really fantastic example. And so people are using that open source code today to, to deliver projects in the mobile space and, and in the embedded space. Mm. That's really interesting. That was my next question. Actually, I was going to ask you: Is what 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 cool things have you seen people do with the platform so far since it is out in the wild? You know, what what kind of things have? What's the most interesting thing you've seen somebody somebody pick up and, and build with this platform? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the you know I referenced a couple uh, the the hang glider project, which I, I think is going to be hard to beat anytime soon. Um, there's there's lots <laughs> of fun little things. You know, the things that I love are the things that aren't necessarily like unbelievably cool but they're things that people need in their in their world you know so um we had somebody build a, a fish tank, a saltwater aquarium monitor. We had somebody um, build a cat door monitor, right? So they could they could know whether the cat was in or out of the house and have that that echoed around their home um, in different displays. Um, we've done student projects. We were uh, with WIST where they did um, a number of different user interface concepts. Somebody did some uh, a project with a mop, the gamification of a mop to make it more fun to clean your kitchen floor, um, which was, was kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, there's just all these things. And I, I think what's, but what's really cool is, it, it, and very consistent with the idea of makers, is that um, 
you should make what matters to you, right? You know, Samsung and Apple and Sony and Microsoft and, and whoever are going to make these, these huge mass market things with massive investments. And we're not going to beat those guys. And we, we shouldn't even try it. They're awesome, right? Like we like those products. It's good. We should come up with the next thing. We should come up with things that are meaningful to our community, to a, whether that's a, an interest community or, or, or a, a community in the real world. And we, we should make things that are new. And some of that stuff takes root. Like wearables grew up in the crowdfunding space before it became kind of a mainstream thing where the big players jumped in, right? And so I think the real power of prototyping and, and what open source contributes to that is the ability for people with ideas to kind of work together to, to prove that those things are possible and bring them into the public view um, and, and help to bring them into the mainstream or just to create great things for, for a particular community that will never be, you know, a billion units, but they're going to be incredibly valuable to 5,000 people. Right. right. And, and so that's the kind of stuff that I really love to see. I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy when our tools are used by a large company and help them be more effective and make a better product. It's great. Why not? But I'm even happier when I can see it being done by individuals who don't have access to infinite resources, who are working at, you know, out of their garage or, or out of their, their, um, their office at home um, to prove that something's possible and make something that's useful for them. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <clears throat> Excuse me. You talked a couple times about your your team. How many people are there actually working on this? Um, and do you also accept contributions from outside or people outside the uh, like the people who bought the you know the original uh, Konoma Create on on Indiegogo? Are they contributing code back to the to the project? We uh, so the team is about thirty people, and we're we're spread around the world. We got uh, some in Belgium, some in China, some in Japan, and a lot in California. Uh, but um, you know we're we're um, working on so many things. Thirty doesn't feel like a lot, uh, but it's it's great. It's a really good group. Um, we do accept pull requests on our GitHub repository, um, GitHub.com/slash/Kenoma. Um, I think as, we, as I've heard from so many people who started open source projects, the first set of things that you get are people correcting typos um, and bugs in the sample code, which is, which is great. Um, and we're starting to see more activity in terms of like the actual code and, and, and things there. Um, we host a forum at forum.kenoma.com where, where the team members hang out. Um, where people can ask questions and discuss. Um, and so we're happy to work there. So, you know, we're absolutely uh, pleased to take in contributions or, or ideas um, from people um, who are working with, with our software. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to... I'm, I'm a. I'm not even a beginning maker. I'm, I'm like a no maker. But this is. But this is really inspiring me. The the one device looked like a little uh, USB stick. Would that be something I could plug into a USB port on on uh, my laptop? Uh, so that is um, that's an HDMI port. So you actually plug oh. that into the back of your TV, like you uh, like a uh, like a Google Chromecast, for example. And uh -huh. so then you program it over Wi-Fi, and you can script, you know, your TV. And so it's sort of fun. Like Kenoma HD, it, I mean, it's a tiny little device, but it gives you access to the biggest screen in your house. And you know, we just thought like that, you should be able to script just like everything else. So we have with Kenoma Element, you know, this little device, we have no screen at all, right? Yep. With Kenoma Create, we have a built-in screen, uh, kind of small, but, but very usable. And with Kenoma HD, we have um, access to your, your, um, your television, whatever big screen you have there. So you kind of have you know, the full range of choices there. So I could essentially make it like a, a remote broadcast, play things on my laptop and send it over Wi-Fi and have it put up on the big screen? Exactly, exactly. So you could build apps that would let you orchestrate those kinds of scenarios. Um, you know, you could also have your TV connect directly to your cloud hosting service and, and show data from there, right? So you could you could have your TV and your cloud work directly together as well. Oh, that's fun. I want one of those now. Yeah, <laughs> I want yeah, all see? of them, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got me convinced. I need to become a maker. I need to start playing with this stuff. But, and we're almost out of time. In fact, Aaron and I were just chatting that uh, we... We looked at the clock and went, oh, my God, it's, we're at the end of the show. Uh, is there anything we haven't covered yet that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Well, like I said, I think every, you know, we're talking about open source. Our code is open. Go, go check it out on GitHub. You know, I think the thing that we're kind of leaning to, actually, I'll show you here, Randall. This is the Chrome mm -hmm. HD. That's the yeah. HDMI port right there. Right. Um, you know, the thing that we're leaning towards with all this is, and, and your, your comments really express it, is, it's really cool to be able to script the devices in your house, right? Like, how awesome to be able to control what's on your TV. And as all of our devices start to have digital components in them, right, as all of our devices are powered by computers inside and have a network connection, 
why shouldn't we as users be able to script them all, right? And that, that or, or program them. And that, that's kind of at the core of what open source was about, users having control of their devices. And part of what we're trying to do with Kinoma.js and our open source software is provide a software stack that can live inside devices that um, you know, can run effectively there that anybody can program, that anybody can control so that whatever the device is in their world, they're able to program it and modify it to do what they want it to do to get the behaviors that they want and not just cross their fingers that the next software update from the manufacturer will do what they want. And so that, that's really where we're headed. And, and open source is a critical part of that because the open source community is some of the most active and talented programmers in the world. And they're the ones that can bring these ideas to life. They're the ones that can show it's possible and show their friends and neighbors and employers to make it happen in the real world. Awesome, awesome. I, just, I, didn't, I don't think it got said earlier, but uh, I played around Blocky a little bit last night, and uh, it reminds me immediately of Scratch. Uh, was that mm -hmm. deliberate? Um, you know, Google did Blockly, and they absolutely borrowed from Scratch, and they, they don't they, they don't try to hide it at all. And in fact, I think they've hired some people who worked on Scratch at one point to work on um, Blockly now. So uh, I think those similarities are gonna are gonna stick. And I think it's great. You know, we've we've talked to kids who got started with Scratch. They look at Blockly and they say, oh, "That's familiar. That's great." And what what a great way for them to kind of ease their way into programming. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've got two final questions that I have to ask, or they yell at me in my uh, in my email. And that is, uh, what's your favorite scripting language? Oh, but that's easy, right? We've been talking about JavaScript all day. There's only one answer. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's easy. And your favorite text editor? You know, it's terrible. Um, I use whatever text editor my uh, my environment gives to me, which means these days I'm using Xcode, but I don't love it. The, the last text editor I loved was MPW, which means I suppose I should be using BB Edit, but, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I, we could keep talking for another hour easily. I know Aaron had at least another hour of questions to ask, and I had a bunch that I'm sort of sitting on just because Aaron was asking such great questions. But I really want to thank you and appreciate that you came on the show. Peter, Hottie, uh, welcome, uh, welcome back. No, <laughs> thanks for being on the show. There we go. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much. Good talking to you guys. Very good, good. That was Peter Hottie representing the Konoma Project. Uh, Aaron, I already know what you think, but... Why don't you go ahead and tell us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is this is really cool, especially like the aesthetic value of what they've done. You don't see that from a lot of these types of projects. Uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, you get the the green board or perhaps it's a blue board, uh, whatever color silicone and, and additive you want to put in there. But um, but I like the fact that this is relatively easy for someone to pick up. Uh, and use, right? Especially for beginners, we'll call them beginners. They might not be kids, they might be grandmas and grandpas. Um, so I think it's it's relatively easy to use, which is great. Um, and uh, the fact that you can take your code and make it portable. I mean, that Konoma HD, for example, you mentioned this too, but uh, especially since it's running JavaScript, it makes it perfect for dashboarding type um, applications, right? So if you're in a company and you're, and you're trying to keep track of what's going on, or maybe you're, you're developing some sort of cool product or a software product or something, and you need to keep track of a hundred different developers and see what, who's making progress and what's going on. I mean, that would be perfect to just slide that thing in there and, uh, have a nice little dashboard running up on a nice big screen. So everyone can see, Oh, we, we, we fixed, uh, you know, 50 bugs today. Uh, yay. Everybody gets beer or something. Um, I can see that working out really, really well. And for 25 bucks with built-in Wi-Fi, you're not spending a lot of money to get that functionality. I know that uh, some people may balk at the price of the Konoma Create, but even if you tried to put together your own Konoma Create with the touchscreen, with the Wi-Fi, with everything else that's in there, um, you're you're going to be spending about that much anyway. So, um, you know, I think the I think the pricing here is very, very reasonable for what they're offering. And, you know, I, I was just thinking of an application for those, the, the HDMI device, the HD device. Uh, where I'm at here at ZipRecruiter, they have all these big uh, screen TVs sort of, you know, plastered across uh, uh, the entire wall. Is that a word? I don't even know. I'm, I'm making it up this morning. I don't care. Um, and so plastered, that's the word I was looking for. There we yes, go. Yes, uh, Yeah, not plastered. What the hell is plastered? All right. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I think they're doing it all from one central um, video feed. And they put these flashy displays of who made the most sales today and important announcements for things coming up and stuff. But it would be really interesting to plug one of these into each one of the TVs separately. And then they could have screens that are tailored for that row of, of seats or something. Exactly. Because you could actually access, oh, this is, oh, that's such a, all right. I'm, like I said, we could talk about this for another hour, but we're almost out of time. So I've got to wrap things up here. Any, any last two or three sentences? 
Uh, no, I just, I mean, I, I hope everyone goes out and tries it. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens with this, especially in the educational space with the Kenoma Create, because I think that that's a barrier right now for a lot of kids. I was talking to the superintendent of our school district and it's like, okay, well, yeah, we could give everybody a Raspberry Pi, but then what do they do? They need a, you know, they need a monitor, they need a keyboard, they need a mouse at the, at the very least, because people you know aren't going to be ready to jump in and start writing code and be on the command line hundred percent of the time. So, uh, you know, how do they do that? How does that work? You know, and I, I didn't really have a good answer for him. Um, but with something like Kenoma Create that solves all those problems automatically. Well, yeah, and actually, you know, if you think about the cost of equipping a lab for students to even play with a with a, 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 a all of their small devices, you know, compare that to just a hundred bucks that you'll pay for a Kenoma Create, and then your devices are pretty cheap. So that's that's it, it, you get your per student cost way way down. So yeah, that's that's this is this is this could this could be a very big game changer in this arena. This is really an exciting time to be talking about this stuff. But I've got to talk about other people too coming up in the upcoming shows next week. We have Pywick, which is web analytics, uh, to leap after that, which is application lifecycle management. Uh, and my favorite, well, the, the show I'm looking forward to quite a bit was uh, Stephen Ressler's coming on to talk about bridge designer and the bridge contest, which again, getting students involved in something very, very interesting and actually somewhat practical, actually building a bridge in, in their simulator and seeing if they, how to do it with the least number of parts to all these trucks to go across. Uh, open for high school students to be able to participate and it's also open source software so you can play with it, which is, I was building bridges that were all falling a lot. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> uh, we just added the schedule. I've been sending out emails, opened up Q one and I got just now on the schedule book type which is a book publishing system from the authorship all the way through the maintenance beautiful books translating stuff into and out of PDF for example in case you have some existing material that you want to pick up and, and, and include looks really really cool I may actually start using it for something like that because I'm looking for some more authoring software I also added the schedule open unison which is identity management so if you have two factor authentication how do you integrate that with your LDAP system for example so this is for things like that I also added the schedule just recently uh, OpenAV, which is a uh, OpenAV Productions, which is a musical synthesizer and performance uh, device. So all sorts of audio, you know, virtual synthesizers, uh, drum machines, everything. And this this is going to be an interesting show to listen to, which will be really fun. Um, also. Real close to the schedule, we're just doing a couple of arguments about dates, is Muse Score. speaking of music again, professional music typesetting, all open source. Beautiful stuff coming out there. I was looking through their website uh, as I was planning for the show. So I have a lot more people still on the short list. I'm going to fill up Q1 probably in the next uh, month or so, uh, but I think we're going to be able to fill every single slot. We have so many people on the short list, just a matter of me getting all the email out. Uh, to see that list, you can go to our homepage, twit.tv slash floss, and link there, it says, see our upcoming guests. Uh, if you, if there's some project that you want to, uh, to, to have on the show, uh, almost all these projects actually were people that you recommended to me. So, and don't just send me the name of the project, please. It, it's sort of wasted my time because then I have to go look up stuff. Instead, you should contact the, uh, project leader or the community representative or whoever sort of seems like they'd be the right person to talk to and have them email me, Merlin at StunEngine.com. That email address is on the homepage of the show. Uh, and then that's how we fill shows up. We have a live stream. We did not take any questions this time from the live stream, but uh, we often do. Uh, we tape at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. 8 a.m. Pacific time. Do not confuse the P in Pacific with PM. That's what I got to figure out here. Tuesdays, uh, generally, at live.twit.tv. You can actually come in and see the show being taped, see all the mistakes behind the scenes, and also comment on the chat room. Uh, you can follow us on Floss Weekly on Google+, and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at, at Merlin on Twitter and on Google+, as Randall L. Schwartz. I actually don't source many things on Twitter directly. Everything's all usually linked back to something I just did on Google+. Um, uh, as you might have noticed, I've been gone for a week. Uh, I was on a cruise out of uh, San Diego down to uh, um, uh, Mazatlan, Puerto Vallarta, and um, Cabo. Had a great time down there. It was 85 degrees in all three of those ports. And I come back to Portland and it's like 30. So I really missed the warm weather. And it happened to be on my birthday. And on birthday night, the, the night of my birthday, they did karaoke. So I sang as... Birthday boy Randall. Boy, wasn't that fun. I'm going to make this an annual tradition now because it's a nice, relatively affordable cruise and uh, pretty close to my home, the town's stuff. So that's good. Uh, I have nothing to plug right now. Oh, yes, I will be at scale one way or the other in uh, January, February, January, February. 
one of those two months. <laughs> Coming up soon. I think it's I think it's beginning of February. Um, and so uh, say hi to me there. Uh, I'm either speaking on Dart or I am uh, going as a representative for Floss Weekly. One or the other. I'll either be press or I'll be a, a speaker. But I'll be there for sure. That's all I got to plug. Uh, Aaron, anything for you? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. I might try to get down to uh, scale this year. We'll see. It's been a few years since I've been there. I'd like to get back down. Um, and I think that their call for papers is either closed or closing. So if I want to speak long, down there, I better gone. get my. It's all long done, gone. huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's and in fact, I, I can never get. I, I can never do it in time. I'm always like, oh, I want to do that, and then I'm like, oh, it's like three three weeks ago they closed or something. <laughs> Yeah, and I had uh, I had uh, dinner with uh, one of the people that's on the committee, and they said they had like five times the number of submissions than they could actually do. So the hard part is throwing wow. away eighty percent of what would be really good talks. Oh man, man so, maybe yeah. they need to expand or something. <laughs> well, they're they're doing an extra day already this year, so this is good. Wow, we'll, wow. We'll have to have cool. uh, we'll have to have to have our, our token uh, scale representative come on and talk more about it coming up soon. So that'll be yeah, really definitely. cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. But a couple of other things anyway, you can yes. uh, follow me on Google Plus, of course. Uh, I'm Aaron Newcomb there. You can also follow what I'm doing at Venetian Makerspace, which I run here in my hometown. Uh, we're doing a lot of really cool things there. And this weekend, actually, tune in uh, live if you want to or follow it up in the recording. I'll be on the new screensavers. So uh, talking about some really cool things. Uh, the plan right now, I think, is perhaps I'll bring a project that we've been doing in the makerspace, a 3D scanner uh, that we use mm. to scan in images. And then you take them over to the 3D printer and print them out. So if you want to duplicate something or or just scan it in and modify it slightly, maybe add something here, add something there, and then print it out, make it work better, you can do that. So uh, that'll be this weekend. Uh, to be slightly devious, uh, can it scan like a key and make a duplicate of that key? Uh, yes. Although if you're, yeah, you could, you could totally do that. Um, it may be some, some keys may be more difficult to print out than others. For example, if you have a void in your key on both sides of the key, uh, oh. it might be difficult for the 3d printer to do it. You could do it, but it just may be, it may not come out exactly right. And then it may not fit in your, in your lock. So, um, could you do it? Yes. Uh, would it, would it be difficult? Yeah, probably. But. Yeah, I think when we had Bree Predis on the show, I actually asked him that question, too, and he went, oh, hmm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. DB's guy. Anyway, all right, we're running over. So uh, thanks, Aaron, again for co-hosting the show, and thank you all for, for hosting last week's. So that was really cool. Oh, yeah, anytime. I'm always happy to jump in and lend a hand. Awesome, awesome. And we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.